this is one of the big myths that people talk about around sex life, which is that the amount of sex that you have matters and it really doesn't. So what I mean by that is that if you ask most people how often they should be having sex a week, I mean, what do you think they would say? Your friends or people on the street? How much they should be having sex? Yeah, a week, a month. How much do you think they'd say? Three times a week. Everyone says three times a week. Really? It's this kind of urban myth that, again, forms part of our sexual script. If we're not having sex three times a week, there's a problem. It's actually drastically different than that. The average times people in the, in the UK, and, and actually it's kind of replicated around the world. But what's fascinating is that we're using frequency as a yardstick of a good sex life. Mm. And there is no correlation between the frequency of sex and sexual satisfaction. None whatsoever. So you're saying it's quality over quantity? Absolutely. You could be having sex, you know, once a year that completely blows your socks off, makes you feel alive, makes you feel super connected, um, that's really exploratory, where you lose yourself in it. And that is better than having sex once a day where you're not enjoying it, your mind's not in it, it's not pleasurable, you're feeling disconnected, you're feeling awkward. So it's so interesting that we get so hung up on frequency. In fact, the average amount of times people are having sex in the UK, if people are interested, is around about three times a month. But there is a huge amount of variation there. So plenty of people in relationships that haven't had sex for months and are quite happy with that, and plenty of people having sex more. But I think having that average is quite useful to talk about because actually it's, a, it's quite surprisingly different to how most people perceive it should be. Do you think you should schedule sex? No, never, ever schedule sex. Because you said, let's come back to it on the weekend. I was thinking, yeah. fact, let's just ruin the weekend. I'd like, to, I'd like it to be spicy and spontaneous. So um, it's one of our sexual scripts that sex, spontaneous sex is better. And I don't necessarily agree with that. But I do agree with the idea that scheduling sex just creates pressure for everyone. How can you, in advance, agree to something that you don't know if you're going to feel like when you get there? And all that does is create pressure. What you should do, though, in today's day and age is schedule physical intimacy, schedule some type of sexual currency, because we're so busy. If you don't do that, when is it going to happen? The issue I have, though, is if I schedule physical intimacy, mm -hmm. then, okay, I, and I keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the expectation comes in that we have sex after the physical intimacy. It's also the same thing with like date night. Mm -hmm. If you're parents and you get one date night a week, mm -hmm. we all know when we need to get this, <laughs> we need to make this thing happen. So it becomes scheduling sex because you're scheduling date night once a week. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you've got two options, haven't you? One is that you wait until it's really high pressure and you don't initiate it very often. You wait for this date night. I don't know, once a week, once a month, and everyone knows there's all kinds of stuff riding on it. And that makes it po possibly the worst set of circumstances to ev for everyone to feel like sex. Lots of high pressure, sex that might feel formulaic. Everyone's distracted. That means they can't get into it. It's not great sex. The other option is that you keep high levels of sexual currency and you try your best to schedule brief moments of physical intimacy, which could act as scaffolding to take it further. You're right in that you may start to build up an expectation that, oh, every time we say we'll have a bath together, we end up having sex. That might happen. But when you invite someone into the bath, you are inviting them into the bath, right? So you're not inviting them saying, let's have a bath and have sex afterwards. You're saying, do you fancy having a bath together? The fact that you both know where the bath might lead is fine because it allows you to get into that headspace. Oh, okay. Okay. I hadn't thought about sex tonight, but the bath might lead to sex. So let me get into a sexual headspace for a minute. So that's quite useful. The problem comes when you say to them afterwards, you said you wanted a bath and we've not had sex. Well, that wasn't what you invited them into. You invited them into the bath. So you have to be okay if it doesn't lead to that. But if you initiate these types of things more, if you think about it, scattergun approach, more of them are likely to go where you want them to go versus that one time of high pressure. We all have a bit of an idea in our head, maybe from pornography or something else or movies, that it should just flow. Yes. That it should just, you know, and so when our sex doesn't flow, we think something is broken and wrong with it. Mm -hmm. We should, we just walk in, hi babe, how was work? Da, da, da. Oh, off we go. We're off to the yeah. race. It's like every day. Yeah. And it should happen every, every other night. <laughs> um, 
And if it's not flowing and happening every other night, we think we need to go and like, yeah, you know, fix this. Someone's to blame. Something's wrong mm-hmm. with me or him or. So let's come back to frequency because that's a big one. But before we get onto that, occupying the space in between willingness. So that's a nice idea that I've had or you've had, but I'm not there yet. And desire, when your desire kicks in, is actually quite an uncomfortable space to occupy. And one of the things I like to do in, in my work with people is to try and help them get comfortable in that space. Because as you say, we have this idea that we should be feeling it before we start. That's wrong. We know that now. But also that it should be easy for us just to slip into that sexual headspace to lose that awkwardness, to lose that sense of, I don't actually know if I'm going to feel like it. I might do. Can we just continue what we're doing and I'll see? Occupying that space in between willingness and desire is really a key part of initiation. Because if you initiate with, shall we have sex? It doesn't really give you a chance to see if you can occupy that space, does it? You have mm-hmm. either have to say yes or no. Mm-hmm. Do you not think it's harder for men as well in some regards? Because like we got to get, you know, the Eiffel Tower up in, in, in a heterosexual relationship. There's like, it's very easy to see if the man is aroused, whereas it's less obvious. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, you, there's ways to tell, obviously, yes. without getting too detailed, but it's, <laughs> it's so clear if the man is aroused. <laughs> there's no yeah. hiding it. <laughs> For all of us, our body's arousal response and the degree with which we're turned on in our mind, so desire, don't actually always match as much as we'd like them to. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience or any of your listeners have, but it can be quite common for men to want to be getting in a sexual headspace or actually be feeling desire, but not be hard. And because it's a visual sign, sometimes their partners, whether they're male or female partners, can take that really personally. Mm-hmm. What does that mean about me? I've had, I'm going to be honest, because that's the whole point of this podcast, was I've had multiple times in my life where I've not been able to get an erection. Mm. And uh, it's so awkward and it's... The minute they realize that you're, you're not going to be able to get an erection, what do I say? Mm-hmm. You know, what do I say? Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned it because it's so common and it's common because this is called arousal non-concordance. So an idea that our bodies don't always do what our brains are thinking. So you might think you want to have sex, mm. but your body doesn't always respond. And that happens for people of all genders. It's just more challenging for people with penises, right? Because you can see it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it brings with it that extra level of pressure. As soon as you've got that pressure, then as we know, your attention goes elsewhere, your worry increases, that turns down arousal, like turning down the TV, less chance of an erection. So can I ask then, what do I do in that moment and what should they do? Yes. As in like, how do they help me in that very embarrassing moment? And what, what do I say? Yeah. So they first need to understand that no erection doesn't mean that you don't want to have sex. It might sometimes, of course, but if you're saying, look, I'm, I'm really keen for this, I'm just not there yet, then they need to take that at, at face value, okay? That's really important. Otherwise, you end up feeling as though it's a judgment on your attraction or your desire for them, which it's not. Um, the second thing is there needs to be less focus on the need for the penis to be hard. And that comes from delineating this idea of this set menu of sex, which means a hard penis has to be part of it. There's plenty of other things that you could do sexually. Mm-hmm. If you're feeling like you want to be sexual, which will move your attention back to sexual things, things that might really turn you on. So for example, giving oral sex is often something that a lot of men say really turn them on. Obviously it's not for everyone. The vibrator out. Yeah, all kinds of things. Watching someone else's sexual pleasure can really turn us on. For some people, it's really hard for them to get used to um, enjoying sensation when their penis is soft. They they kind of want to avoid it. It'd be mm-hmm. great if they didn't and they could be comfortable with enjoying that touch even then, but it might mean moving, moving your attention to another person. What usually happens then is that at some point it comes back, mm-hmm. but it only comes back if you don't worry about it and yes. if you don't put pressure on it. That has to be not just about you. It has to be about the person you're with as well. Because, you know, if they're like, oh, well, never mind then, we'll just do it another time. Okay, so that's really interesting. So the foundation of all of that, though, is communication. Absolutely. Because without that, if if I go flaccid and then I don't say anything about it and I just lay there like dormant and then she's laying there dormant and mm-hmm. then we try and go to sleep and then we you know, we never address it, we never get to communicate because maybe I did want to have sex, but maybe yeah. for some reason my, my to-do list was still on my mind. Exactly. And notice that the assumption behind it 
yeah. is that the sex that you're going to have is penis and vagina penetration. Is that even what she wants? Mm. And if we could initiate sex in a way that was clearer, if we could say to our partners easily, um, I'm really horny, what I'd really like to do is X and it all be about me. Are you up for that? That's quite different. If we're able to be clear about that, what would that do to your confidence with erections? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. If she'd actually gone into that sexual encounter saying, you know what, all I want you to do is make me come. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel like penetrative sex tonight. If she'd felt confident to say that, I can guarantee there would have been no problem with the erection. The erection would have come as part of it because the whole process would have been arousing. This is a bit of a left field one, but it, I just remembered a, a debate me and my friends had in our little like mates chat. Is it better to have sex before or after you eat? Because he was like, <laughs> oh no, I, he, this, I thought this was weird. He was like, I have sex before we go on the date. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what? You have sex before the date? He was like, yeah, no sex after, no sex after food. It is a good idea, to be fair. A lot of people say they struggle. Really? When they're full, they feel quite unsexy. Ah, They feel a bit lethargic. Bloated and stuff. They feel a bit bloated. They don't feel great about their body, perhaps. Um, A lot of people do that. If they're going to have a date night, I mean, I I never like date nights because I think by the time you get home from a date night, Mm. you've maybe had a bit to drink. You've maybe had a bit to eat. It's maybe quite late. It's not the best conditions for having sex, actually. I'd rather, if you had a date night, you kept it on fun, emotional connection, relationship satisfaction, and then you plan an in at home date night that's more about physical intimacy. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. it's not it's not that easy to do the two. So your friend's probably right. Probably before oh, food gosh. is better. If you were to give me a couple of pieces of simple advice on how to keep desire high in my relationship, what would you say? I would say kiss more. Kiss for kissing's sake. Okay. Kiss kissing often falls off the agenda in long term relationships. The number of times I see that um, with couples I'm working with who've been together decades, they only kiss as part of sex or as an initiation of sex. So kissing is a great way of triggering desire. It's also a great way of getting our sexual needs met. So that would be one. The second would be you have to make time to schedule physical intimacy of some type because remember that desire is triggered by that kind of sexual stimuli, whether it's Um, getting naked on the couch and watching a film together that, you know, has got good sex scenes in it, whether it's massage, whether it's the bath, whether it's um, some kind of date night that involves use of your bodies. Without that, there are no triggers to your desire. So you're just kind of waiting to feel it. The third is understand how desire works. It's drastically different than what you've been sold. And you're normal if you struggle to get in the headspace sometimes. What about distance? And you know, this idea of like, you talked about how they kind of, your partner can lose their sexual currency if they become a carer or, you know, I've heard before if they become like too much of a mum or a dad in your mind and they stop becoming Mm -hmm. a a sort of sexual partner. Relationship dynamics are quite fascinating, uh, as you say, because when we talk about them, we often hear things like, well, obviously if you're experiencing great amount of relationship conflict, it's going to affect your sex life. I mean, that's of course, right? We all know that to be true. But actually, it's the subtle dynamics that are quite important. It's um, having distance from each other and being able to bring in novelty and newness, a bit like you do with kind of having that that physical distance, but it's also an emotional separation, isn't it? Because Mm -hmm. you're having experiences separately and then coming back together to talk about them. It's also about what roles you might get typecast into in your relationship. So something I talk about often is the idea that when we have sex with the same person for a long time, we can start to feel as though there's only one way for us to be sexually, and that's the way they're kind of expecting us to be. So it can feel quite suffocating. And sometimes that's the reason that people go outside of a monogamous relationship is because they want to experience themselves differently. They want to be a different person sexually. And because they can't talk to their partner about that, and they feel typecast in that dynamic, you know, you're the dominant one, I'm not, or um, the sex that we have is really kind of sensual and caring, and I want it to be passionate and animalistic. It's really difficult. I'm trying not to break your client patient confidentiality. <laughs> yeah, but I'm I just won't thinking, do that. <laughs> just thinking about the other, like, un- the unexpected things that people come to you and ask you about. You know what's one of the most unexpected things? After 20 years of doing my job, one of the things that has come up a lot recently 
that has surprised me, and it may not surprise you, I don't know if you've got any, but the impact of pets on people's sex lives. Oh, my, Have you well, got any pets? I've got a dog and he loves to watch. There you go. And, you know, this was a massive surprise to me. I've been doing this job decades and only recently I, something came up on my Insta and it blew up with people saying, yeah, my pet's constantly ruining the mood. They're either trying to get involved or they're watching <laughs> or they're in the room or it puts the other person off. This was one of the biggest surprises to me, honestly. So what's the, so people are saying that what the pet is jumping in or my pet, my, my dog, um, I think he was concerned about my partner. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. he thinks that she's being attacked. Right. So he's being she's, protective. Yeah. He's very, very protective. So sometimes I think he thinks, he looks really upset. And then it, when he was younger, he used to like wee himself oh. when he was watching, which is like a nervous wing. Because like, that's mommy what it and daddy was. are fighting. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it was wee. <laughs> I, think it was. I mean, it's, it's a big deal when you think about what we talked earlier about attention and distraction, because... Nobody really wants to have to take account of a third person in, in, well, unless you want a third person in the room, but you know, a pet in the room, basically. It's quite distracting, right? It is, yeah. And yeah. if you put them outside, my understanding, because I've heard this as cats as well, my understanding is that they will bark and scratch at the door. It's not like you can keep them away very easily. This is a massive challenge. Pets should come with a warning label for your sex life. So you think pets should not be invited into the... I would say not. But I mean, some people are obviously fine with it, but the, the reaction I got from people on my social media was, this is a major problem. And I'd never heard of it before. I've never seen it written in research. It's a new thing. Maybe it's lockdown. Everyone got pets. Are you hopeful for the uh, trajectory of sex in this world? I really am, actually. There is, uh, I think there's been a, a boost of sex positivity um, in the media, on social media on TV, shows like Sex Education. I think what I've noticed is that's not yet trickled down to the therapy room. So, you know, what I see and think is happening, I guess because I'm plugged into those things and the types of people I follow on social media, I really feel like it's changing and people are understanding more about sex, feeling more assertive about sex, understanding that it doesn't have to look one way, looking at different relationship structures, not just assuming monogamy, not just assuming heterosexuality but actually what I see in the therapy room is that's not trickled down yet and so my hope is that in the decade that follows we'll be in quite a different place and you know for me as a parent of two boys that's quite an exciting place to be because we know that our first sexual experience is actually quite influential in dictating our sexual satisfaction lifelong so to be able to go into sex with more knowledge, to be able to have an experience that is good rather than bad, which is most people's first experience. I think that's a great gift that we can give younger people. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.